So today's topic is California wildfires and what you need to know about them. The wildfire season is officially over, or at least the old wildfire season, which raises an interesting question. Why are you all here if it's all over? Well, the wildfire season is in fact not over. And I have information that might be useful for you in the future. So let's look at the current wildfire season, which may or may not have just ended. Several wildfires. The biggest one was the Mosquito Fire up in Northern California, more in my neck of the woods. In the Sierras, 76,000 acres burned. The McKinney Fire, Six Rivers Fire. The Fairview Fire was in Southern California. And we had about a dozen major fires. If you add up all of these numbers here, you get about a quarter of a million acres burned. Well, let's compare that to previous years. This is the fire record up to, but not including this summer. And of course, 2020 was the big fire year, 4 million acres burned. Last year, we only burned 2.5 million acres. So where does this year come in? This year comes in down here. So, so far we've gotten away with very little fire damage or acres burned this year. That's the good news. That doesn't mean we're done with fires. And in fact, if you look at the past 40 years, we typically in the first 20 years of that time interval, we're burning about 3 million acres throughout the United States. But beginning in about 2000, this number jumps up to almost 8 to 10 million acres a year. So we got lucky this year, but there's been a lot of fires throughout the United States. And I don't have a new number yet for the year, but I would imagine it's easily up in the 6 to 8 million acre range this year. And another thing that's worth noting is that the fires are getting more expensive. These are not thousands. These are millions of dollars. So this one is actually $10 billion was the damage. This one is $8 billion. That was the Tubbs fire in Napa. The campfire was the one that burned up near Chico and completely destroyed the town of Paradise in the foothills of the Sierra. And the other thing that's worth noting is that almost all of these expensive fires have occurred in the last five years. So there's the 1991 Oakland fire and uh, the 2007 Witch fire, but the rest of these are all within the last five years or so. So we're getting more fires and of course they're getting more and more damaging. And always good to look at the broader picture on this. So here is the fire picture for this summer in Europe. And basically all of Europe was burning this summer. I was in Portugal and there were notices that the trains couldn't go because there was fire in some areas. There were roads that were closed and all through Europe, they had lots and lots of problems with wildfires. And Part of the reason for that was that they had some very intense heat, particularly between July 17th and July 23rd. These are the high temperatures. And if you are not familiar with the centigrade scale, I marked that 40 centigrade is 104 Fahrenheit. So all of Spain, a lot of France up into Germany, they were up above 102 degrees. Here's some European cities, major European cities. They're just not used to this kind of temperature. I mean, London doesn't normally get 91 degrees or Paris doesn't usually get 99 degrees. And in these places, the word air conditioning is not even known. So that exacerbated all the problems. Some people died because of it. And this was a major problem in Europe. And it was also a problem in the United States. And in both cases, we had what was called a heat dome develop. A heat dome is where you have a high pressure system over the continent, which becomes stagnant. It basically gets caught in a loop of the jet stream and it can't move. And there's a feedback mechanism, 
which tends to make that heat dome grow and also get hotter. So we had this large heat dome over Nevada and California and Oregon extending up into Washington and Idaho. And the, we had two of them this summer. One was around the 11th of July and it got to be 103 in Fresno and 103 in Bakersfield. They're used to that temperature, but not for five days in a row. And then the second one hit at the end of August, I believe it was. And this one was really horrendous. In Sacramento, we hit 115, Chico 114, Redding 115, Salinas 111. I mean, these are really unusual figures. Vallejo was 96 degrees in the Bay Area. So these were incredible figures. And just to give you an idea, these are all the temperatures, the maximum temperature in Sacramento for each day of the year for 120 years. And there are all these points. And all the way up here was the temperature on September 6th in Sacramento, 116 degrees. It was the all time high record for Sacramento. In Reno, again, it was 106, and that was within a degree or two degrees of the all-time record there. The other thing worth noting is that these are color-coded by age, so the oldest records are in blue and the most recent ones are in dark red, and you see that the curves tend to be going up. We're getting higher temperatures more and more recently. An article in the Washington Post by Jason Seminow, who's their chief meteorologist, said there is no September on record in the West that has seen a heat wave like this. And he goes on and talks about how unusual this heat wave is. Another measure of what's going on is there are different ways of defining heat waves in different cities. It's a temperature for so many days above a certain thing. But if you calculate all of that, Many cities in the 60s would have two heat waves a year. Now they're typically getting six heat waves a year. So everything is warming up. And yes, as you're probably thinking, this is global climate change, which has a direct effect on wildfires. And it's been estimated that more than half the acreage that burns in these each year globally is due to global climatic change. All right, so let's step back and look at wildfires. People in the forestry business distinguish three types of vegetation. There's ground vegetation, which is basically what's growing right on the ground, low grasses and things like that. There's surface vegetation, which includes shrubs and bushes and small trees that grow above the ground one or two meters. And then you have the crown, which are the big trees that reach up 20, 30 meters above the surface. The normal progression for a fire, a wildfire, is to start off down here as a ground fire. If there's enough fuel and enough heat and enough wind, it'll move up into the surface material. Then it ignites the big trees. And eventually you get the tops of the big trees burning in what is called a crown fire. Here's an example of a crown fire. Often once a crown fire gets going, the fire hops from the top of one tree to the top of the next. The bottom parts of those trees might not even be burning yet because it's just across the top. But as you can imagine, this can move very quickly through a forest. There are several factors that are involved here. One is the nature of the tree, how dry it is and things like that. And so once the fire gets into a tree, it creates an updraft and pulls ashes and embers up into the sky. And then the size of those embers, in other words, what's burning is an important factor. It determines how high they can go. And then the wind that's blowing will affect how far those embers can be carried. And if you have large embers and a strong wind and a good updraft, you can carry those embers downwind quite a ways where they can ignite the upper stories of trees, especially if those trees have been stressed by drought. 
And that's, of course, what we've been having recently. So there's three elements to a forest fire. One is, of course, fuel, what's burning, how dry it is, how it's arranged. Do you have low vegetation that can provide a pathway to the higher parts of the trees? What's the temperature of the trees? What's their dryness and so forth? That's the fuel part. There's also the weather part, temperature, relative humidity, precipitation, atmospheric instability, because it's the atmospheric instability that can drive the lofting of those embers up into the crowns of the trees. And then topography is also important because depending on how the wind is blowing and how steep the can a canyon might be, you could drive a fire way up a canyon or the winds can actually serve to prevent the fire from going up into a canyon. So all of those things go together. Just to give you an example, last year, June 28th, 2021, we had a heat dome that developed over Washington state and temperatures reached 107 in Seattle, 113 in Kent, 112 in Olympia, Washington. Again, these are places that have never even used air conditioning, and yet they were going to have to deal with that. And of course, there's a lot of forested area around there, which suffered from all of this heat. We are also in the middle of what people have now started to call a mega drought. It appears to be a 20-year arid period. Yes, there are wet years, but most often the years are drier than they've normally are. This is Folsom Reservoir. You are looking at the docks or at the skeletons of the docks where people used to park their boats before the water level got too low. So we are dealing with enhanced drought conditions. We're dealing with the formation of these heat domes. And every year in California, we get winds. We get in the north what are called Diablo winds and in the south, the Santa Ana winds. And in this case, there's a high pressure system which parks itself over Nevada at the same time that there is a low pressure system out over the coast, which is why it's probably cool in Monterey right now. There's a low pressure system. And when you have a high pressure system and a low pressure system, the winds blow from high to low. And the greater the pressure difference, the stronger the winds. So we get these periods when we get very, very strong north and northeast winds coming out down the Sierra, through the Central Valley, and out into the Bay Area. And this is another factor driving the wildfires. So all of these things together create extreme fire dangers in California. And as time goes on, every year this situation gets worse, or on average, it gets worse from year to year. So how do we fight these wildfires? Well, I think a lot of people think that it's mostly some guy dragging a hose and hosing down the fire. That actually is not a very common practice. Yes, they do use tank trucks and yes, they do use hoses, but a more common way, I mean, you're dealing with mountainous terrain, you're dealing with often heavily forested terrain, there are no roads, so you can't really drag your hose very far or get your truck up very far. So by and large, the main way of fighting fires here is by setting a backfire. That is, you go to a place where it hasn't burned yet and you purposely set it on fire and hope that the combination of the winds and the topography will drive the fire that you are setting toward the fire that is now burning toward you. And they'll meet somewhere and basically the fire will then run out of fuel because it's been burned already ahead of the fire. This is called a backfire. And a lot of what they do is set backfires and then they call that the fire line. And the idea is to keep the fire from jumping the fire line and going on and burning the next segment of the forest. So most of what they're doing is sort of like garden work with shovels and spades and things like that where they're trying to keep the burn part of the forest from going into an area that's unburned. And that's really the way things are usually done. Now, the effect of all of this or the purpose of all of this is to create what are called fire breaks. So if you can create a fire break, 
And in some cases, we go in and we make artificial fire breaks before the fire even starts by chopping down the trees or building a road through an area. That'll prevent the fire from burning across the road. You try and maintain it from going across the road. And that's how you keep the fire from spreading. Now, you probably have heard the terms containment and control. And maybe you haven't understood those. I didn't understand them for a long time. They will often say fire is 30% contained and 15% controlled. Well, what's the difference? I think this little fence is a good example. Containment is the percent of fire surrounded by a fire line. It might not be a great fire line, but at least you have a fire line to prevent it, you hope, from going any further, although it could still jump the fire line and keep going. That's containment. When you have a really good fire line and it's not likely the fire will spread, then you can say that the fire is now controlled in this area. So I like to think these two fences as the difference between a contained fire and a controlled fire. And another thing that we use when we don't have access to an area is we use aerial tankers which either drop water or they will drop flame retardant in order to prevent the fire from spreading. There is an issue in Europe with fire retardants because the company that make these planes apparently has stopped making them. So they don't know if they're going to be able to continue doing this in Europe. And I suppose this is a problem that we need to worry about also. So now what happened last year, October 1st, 2020 to September 30th, 2021. We had a couple of fires that I want to mention. One of them is the Dixie Fire. It was the earliest big one of the year. It burned 963,000 acres. And that is the second largest fire in California history. Smoke covered the western part of the United States. And the fire itself crossed the crest of the Sierra Nevada, which was highly unusual. We almost never see fires that cross the crest of a mountain. Fire burns up and it starts to burn out as it gets to the crest. And that's an important indication. It was an important new sign that things were different. And it destroyed the town of Greenville in the Sierras, an old gold rush town. Here's the map of it. It's only partial because the fire, the Dixie Fire, started in this canyon, which was up canyon from Paradise, which is where the campfire was that completely destroyed the town of Paradise. This one started farther up the mountains and it went up this way. It covered a part of Lassen National Park and it got out here into the Susanville Honey Lake area. And as I said, it was almost a million acres. The estimated losses are $1.15 billion. And there was significant evidence that PG&E had equipment that played a role in starting the fire. And as I'll talk about a little bit later, this was actually very, very significant in terms of what PG&E has decided to do, because they could be faced with a billion dollar liability for this single fire. The haze covered most of the Western United States and even made it into New York City. On the other side of the continent, you are looking at the Chrysler Building and the MetLife Building. This is MetLife here. This is the Chrysler Building here. And that's what the air looked like in New York City. It was a thick haze full of ash and smoke from California. We also had the Caldor Fire, which burned 220,000 acres. It destroyed 1,000 structures, mostly single-family homes. It, too, crossed the Sierra Nevada, and it threatened Lake Tahoe. So here's the area of the Caldor Fire. It started here in the vicinity of Sly Park and Pollock Pines, Camino, this would be Apple Hill. It started here and it burned up along Highway 50, 
it made it to Echo Summit and then went over Echo Summit down into the Lake Tahoe Basin. So again, it crossed over the crest of the Sierras and notice that it effectively closed any escape route on 50 or 89 out of the Tahoe Basin. It threatened Lake Tahoe. So this is Heavenly Valley, South Lake Tahoe, this is what it normally looks like, and this is what it looked like during the Caldor fire. The fire didn't quite come down to Lake Tahoe, but it went up on the ridge behind it. This is the air in Lake Tahoe. This is not what people pay a million dollars for a condominium to look at, but this is what they had to see during the Caldor fire. And one other one that I want to mention is the KNP fire complex. It was two fires that merged into a single one, and it burned into Sequoia and Kings Canyon National Park. And it was only controlled in mid-December. That doesn't make any sense. This is all supposed to be over by mid-October. But this one kept going. It started late in the season, and it kept going for four or five months before they actually controlled it. Here's the area that was burned. This is Kings Canyon. This is Sequoia National Park. It burned somewhat up into Kings Canyon National Park. The main thing to note here is that a lot of big sequoias, the Sequoia Gigantia, got burned in this forest, in, in this fire, because this is where there were a lot of sequoias. And you, everybody learns in I don't know, elementary school that the trees are redwoods are fire resistant and when it burns, they release new seeds and that sustains the forest and everything else. But this fire was so intense that people have worried that a lot of the trees just got killed off by the fire. So the most important thing whenever we have a fire is to learn something from it. So we might not make the same mistakes the next time, or we can do something differently. So what have we learned from all of these fires? Well, one of the things we've learned is that forest management is incredibly important. Normally, you know, every year the leaves turn, they fall down, trees fall down, debris accumulates in the forest floor. So what do we do about that debris? Well, for almost 100 years, the answer was, well, we didn't do anything about it. We just let it accumulate. And the reason we let it accumulate is because of this guy, Smokey the Bear. Way back in the 30s, there was a small forest fire someplace, I think in New Jersey or something. And after the fire, they found a little bear cub who had been badly burned and they nursed it back to life and it became Smokey the Bear. And he became the symbol of a campaign to prevent forest fires. Now, the original idea of preventing forest fires was that they wanted people who went on a hike into a forest to make sure that their campfires were put out. That's what this was all about. So that's what Smokey the Bear, only you can prevent forest fires. And the goal was to get people to put out their campfires and not discard their cigarettes in the forest. Well, as time went on, this morphed into a campaign that all fires in forests are bad. And so all kinds of fires were suppressed in the United States. And every time a fire broke out somewhere, they rushed in and they put it out. And it didn't burn a lot of the debris that was accumulating on the floor of these forests. And so we've gotten now to the point where many forests have thick layers of debris, old, dried, dead vegetation on the ground. That's the ground layer that I talked about, or the surface layer that I talked about, the low stuff that's there. And that means that when a fire does occur, there's all that kindling on the ground that can just allow the fire to spread like crazy, to spread like, quote, a wildfire. So as far as Smokey goes, you know, I think he needs to be locked up 
and we need to have a different approach. And here's an example of what happens, okay? Under the present regime, we tend to let everything accumulate, no fires, but when a fire gets started, you have all of this easily ignitable material on the ground, it catches fire, everything burns. Whereas if you have these smaller fires, what are called, now called control burns, where you go through and you burn out the vegetation on the ground every so often and keep it from spreading up, then when a fire breaks out, okay, this stuff burns, but it's not enough of it to get up into the crowns of the trees. And so it burns through and it actually cleans out the vegetation. You don't have new trees that are competing with old trees. You don't have kindling there that can set the whole thing off. And after the fire goes through, you've had minimal amount of damage. So people are beginning to recognize the importance of controlled burns. People have understood control burns for a long time, but because of this religion that we have about no fires in the forest, we don't really follow it in most places. And we've gotten a lot of fires that have taken off. Another thing that we learned in the last couple of years is the danger from high tension power lines. In California, most of the water is in the north and we use that water to generate electricity. Most of the people are in the south. And so we need to get the electricity from the north to the south. And that means we put up these high tension power lines. But there's a problem. First of all, these power lines are built out of metal, out of steel, and they stick up hundreds of feet into the air over flat terrain. So the net effect of all of this is that these serve as magnets for lightning. These are effectively lightning rods that attract the lightning when there's a thunderstorm, which we sometimes get during high winds and, and even in dry conditions. So these power lines attract lightning. In addition, the power lines are carrying high tension, meaning high voltage, these things can carry 50,000 or 100,000 volts, which means if a power line gets snapped, even if there's no lightning around, if a power line snaps and falls to the ground, you've got 100,000 volts that could be used to ignite the material that's on the ground. So we've come to recognize that high tension power lines play an important role in triggering wildfires. And a couple of years ago, they started looking at PG&E and they realized that a lot of the fires that we've had in California can be traced back to PG&E, to power lines that snapped or to high tension towers that got hit by lightning. And so here in this study, they found 17 major wildfires scorched a quarter of a million acres in eight counties, destroyed 3,000 structures, and killed 22 people. So the word we're looking for here is liability. Is this PG&E's fault? Well, people have gone to PG&E and said, you know what you need to do is you need to put your power lines below ground. And PG&E said, well, you know, we got 10,000 miles of power lines in California, if we put it underground, it's going to cost us 2.3 million per mile. And if you do the math on that, it looks like you're talking about $200 billion to put everything underground. And of course, PG&E's response to that idea is, well, that's an awful lot of money and we won't be able to pay dividends to our stockholders, and that's the bottom line. So we can't put lines underground because it's too expensive. So for a while, they came up with another solution. They said, well, we got a better solution. It's much cheaper. We will just pull blackouts. We will have 
sweeping blackouts in areas where there is a potential for the conditions that could cause a lightning or a power line cause wildfire. And so for the last two or three years, when the conditions in some areas got right, people got a little phone call or an email that said, hello, we're going to turn off all the power in your county until the threat is passed. And that way we can't be responsible for fires because we've turned off the power. So that worked, except if you were in the area where this was happening and you weren't too happy with it. Another thing that is an issue now is urban expansion. We used to have little communities that develop in valleys, in flat areas up in the mountains. Maybe there was an old lake bed and now there's a community up there. Those communities tended to be spread out but now the population pressure is pushing people up into those valleys. They want housing. And so in response, the, the cities are expanding and building more and more housing because the land is more expensive. They tend to build the houses much closer together and they infringe more onto the forests. So urban expansion is a problem. Couple that with the fact that Lots of people want to live in the mountains, want to live in an isolated place up in the mountains in the forest. This is a real estate from Berry Creek. Berry Creek was completely burned out. These are houses that were for sale in Berry Creek up in the woods. And most of these houses got burned in the fire. So this is another thing that contributes to the cost of these wildfires. Okay, so what happened this year? Well, the new year started off with a bang with a fire in your neighborhood. Unfortunately called the Colorado fire, I think it should be called the Big Sur fire, but in any event, there was a fire, 1500 acres, not a big deal, but you're not supposed to have fires like that in January. Uh, and as I recall, it was pretty close to the beginning of the year. And here's the fire itself with the Bixby Bridge in front, so we were off and running and I was expecting a really, 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 really big fire season this year. The fact that it started off with a fire is just emphasize the whole business of wildfire season doesn't mean anything anymore. The KNP fire burning through December, this one took off in January and it looked like we were going to really have a bad year. And that was followed by, at the end of January, by very high winds, up to 100 miles an hour up in, this, up in the Russian River area. That, in turn, uh, ignited some fires, and people were really talking about how fire season was now all year long. The other thing that was important was that the drought continued. There's this 20-year drought that we're in, but we also have a two-year, we had a two-year drought when it was extremely dry. We had very, very little rain, and it looked like we were going to go into that. In Davis, we had no rain in January or February, and looking at Monterey, I could not find the rainfall for this year, but I know there was not a lot and if we don't get rain in January and February, then when are we going to get the rains? Because this is when the biggest amount of rain should fall. So again, we're, we're gearing up to conditions of very dry ground and high winds and ideal condition for fires to start. We did get some rain this year. September 17th, uh, we had the remnants of Hurricane K came into the area and we had one hell of a rain. And for example, over this four-day period, Santa Rosa was projected to get four times the amount of rain it normally would have gotten. Napa got five times the amount of rain. Downtown San Francisco, four times the amount of rain for the month. But that was a single storm. And the problem with a single storm is it doesn't really do anything to alleviate the drought. And in fact, it exacerbates the fire problem because you get all this rain, it soaks the ground, 
the vegetation starts to grow, especially when it gets hot again, as it did, the vegetation starts to grow. But then if you don't have successive storms, then that vegetation starts to dry out and it becomes totally dry and it simply adds to the amount of tinder that's on the ground and capable of burning. So yes, we had two major storms and a few other little ones, but we didn't get the sustained rains that we needed. One of the most important things though, is that PG&E announced that it was going to underground 10,000 miles of power lines to avoid the problems that it's had and to avoid the liability issues. So here's what their public announcement was, a hardening California's next generation electricity grid, undergrounding 10,000 miles of power lines, approximately 3,600 miles of that 10,000 would be done in the next four years. That's pretty impressive. That's almost a thousand miles a year. So what did they do this year? They're expecting to do 175 miles in 2022. So I don't know what this is all about. If they're gonna do 200 miles a year and they got 10,000 miles to do, that'll only take them what, 50 years to get all of this done. You can go and download this plan. I think maybe, maybe they spent most of this year, no, that was last year, coming up with this plan. You can download it. It's a thousand pages. It addresses everything. Some consultant made a lot of money writing this plan, but so far it's only resulted in about 150 or 200 miles of underground lines so far. But they got a long way to go. We have a long way to go on this. All right, so what's different this year? We are getting a better understanding of how fires burn. It's about four years ago, people started observing during some of these heat waves that the forest fires were behaving differently. Most of the fires would burn as a line of flames, but now they're noticing that you are getting eddies and structures within the fire that really are quite different. Often the fire is kind of able to generate its own weather. And so people have started talking about fire nados, where it's actually a circulating pattern, almost like a hurricane of fire that develops because of the high temperatures, because of the availability of fuel, some people have analyzed some of these plumes. And again, instead of being a line of fire, this thing behaves like a volcano and it explodes up and out and the embers are distributed in all directions. And that causes the fire to spread very quickly. The mosquito fire in September threatened towns in the area between 50 and 80 and it ballooned to 23,000 acres in one day because of this unusual behavior of the winds and the patterns of air movement around the fire itself. So this is a different species of wildfire in a sense. People also started to look at dry lightning. We get dry lightning at times when there's strong winds, high temperatures, and not a lot of moisture. I have a feeling this has to do with charge separation by the strong winds, but whatever it is, we do get what's called dry lightning, and the dry lightning is responsible for a lot of these fires that we're getting now. So somebody started looking, and they realized that there's more dry lightning than they thought, which would explain why we're getting these outbreaks of fires. I mean, often you get a, a dry lightning situation and you'll get five or six fires starting. So dry lightning is something we now recognize as a different sort of beast. It occurs over mountainous terrain and seems to be quite prevalent in Northern California. You may recall that I mentioned that the fires have crossed the Sierra in a couple of instances. 
there's also been an observation that the fires are burning later into the night. The typical cycle has been that as it gets toward nighttime, the temperatures fall and the fire recedes a bit, becomes less intense, all of which makes a bit of sense. But that hasn't been happening as frequently, or I turn it around and say, more frequently now, that does not happen. What they now understand is going on is that because of global climate change, the nighttime temperatures even in the absence of a fire, are higher than they used to be. And the advantage of having low nighttime temperatures is that tamps the fire down a little bit. It also gives the firefighters a chance to recover, but it also gives the vegetation time or an opportunity just to pull up more moisture from the ground, from deeper in the ground. If you don't have that window, or if the window is much shorter, then the vegetation doesn't have a chance to build in a little bit of resilience. And this is particularly marked up in the high elevations where it is higher than it used to be. And so it's easier for the fires to break over the crest of the Sierra because the crests is no longer as cool at night as it used to be. Here's a graph that they put together of overnight low temperatures in California up to 2018. And we see that beginning in about 2000, the nighttime temperatures are on a different line. They're warming and they're warming quite fast. And I don't have the new data on this, but it's probably gonna look a lot like this, especially with the heat waves that we had that it's a couple of degrees warmer. The minimum temperature is a couple of degrees warmer than it was. And that is enough to drive these fires, first of all, to keep them burning hot at night and to drive them over the crest of the Sierras. We have to figure out how to deal with that. And then this is just a graph that somebody put together showing the deficiency in water vapor that is developing during these nighttime droughts. So all of these areas are deficient in moisture at night compared to what they were in the past. So we're developing other ways of fighting fires, naturally. One is fire suppression. As I said, people have talked about fire suppression. A lot of people, particularly in academia, have argued that fire suppression is a bad thing in forests and that you should let small fires burn and dig out, destroy low vegetation. This was practiced by a lot of indigenous people in the past, but we have not been doing much of it lately. So this year they decided to let a fire burn, actually two fires burn in New Mexico, in the Santa Fe National Forest on the assumption that it would reduce the risk of a much larger fire. That fire ultimately exploded into the largest wildfire in New Mexico history. And now the explanation is that we did not adequately account for climate change in our modeling of how the fire would behave. And so we had put the wrong numbers in, we got the wrong numbers out, and then this whole thing just got away from us. Unfortunately, that gives the whole idea of controlled burns a black eye. There have been a couple of other cases of controlled burns that have gone the wrong way. And so it only makes people less willing to accept the idea of doing something like this. And of course, it's all Joe Biden's fault. I don't quite understand the logic here. But whatever it is, it's Joe Biden's fault. I think he went to see the fire. And so in that sense, he was made to own the fire. And somebody was arguing it was his personal decision to let the fire burn. And therefore, that's his fault. 
We have new tools for fighting fires. One of them, of course, is drones. And they are now regularly using drones. They send the drones up. And when you couple the drones with a thermal imaging mapper, you can get a great picture of where the fire is and where the fire is hottest. And that is certainly useful in terms of figuring out where to drop your water or fire retardant and where to send your equipment in order to be most efficient. There are people who are actually studying the ground cover in different places to see what burns, what doesn't, how they can integrate that information with the thermal mapping in information to figure out where the fire is going to go and where they can be less concerned about it. Here's a new way of fighting the fire. When the fire got into the high country behind Heavenly Valley, that's where they ski. And that means they make snow. And so what they did is they turned on their snow blowers and they were blowing snow as a way of fighting the fire. Again, not very useful on a large scale. And then they started this year wrapping some of the base of big trees, particularly the big sequoias, in aluminum foil as a way of protecting them. And apparently this worked. And although a lot of the area around it was burned, the foil was enough to prevent the fire from getting up into the tree. I suppose they'll do more of this if they can find these big sheets of aluminum foil to wrap around the base. I also mentioned fire retardant. Fire retardant is pretty nasty stuff. You wouldn't want to get hit by it. You wouldn't want it to hit your home or your car. You can't just wash it off with a hose. It's meant to retard fires, but it's also pretty resistant. And so it's not very practical for people to use around their house. I did find a company that's making something called FosCheck. You just spray it on and it's supposed to be a fire retardant. I am not getting paid by this company. I have no idea how good this is, but this is from their literature. All you need to do is spray around your house and your trees and you should have protection from a, for a year. You can check it out if you want. I have no opinion in this. I'm just telling you, I know it exists now. And State Farm, which is my insurance company, is offering added wildfire protection in California, Arizona, and Washington. I'm not sure what this means. I think it means they have a set of cr criteria. And if you meet their criteria, and you have an agent come out and check, then they will give you a higher level of insurance for wildfire. Another problem that we have to deal with is evacuations. We had some issues with evacuations with Hurricane Ian. Those of you who remember the Oroville Dam incident, people were told to evacuate. And I started getting phone calls because I'm Mr. Disaster in my department, I started getting phone calls from people saying they told us to evacuate, but they didn't tell us which way to go. So if Oroville Dam fails, which way do I drive to avoid this? The bottom line is that we don't have very good evacuation plans. And in the case of Tahoe, I pointed out that the roads out of Lake Tahoe to the south, in other words, 89 and 50 were in the fire. So there were not too many ways to get out of South Lake Tahoe. Basically, there were two. You went to the east or you went to the west and went north along Lake Tahoe. And so everybody tried to evacuate the same way. And what happened? Miles long traffic jams. We need to worry about this. Evacuation is something that applies to a lot of different natural disasters. Even in an earthquake afterward, you might want to evacuate. Wildfires, lots of circumstances, flooding, where you have to worry about evacuation. Most places do not have good evacuation plans. And when you think about California, a lot of places have one or two roads in to them. Particularly when you get up in the mountains, you know, 50 is coming in and 50 is going out and that's it. Or, or 80 is coming in and 80 is going out. And that's pretty much it. So you need to think about evacuation plans. People have said, yes, we need to do it as part of the climate change bill. 
Some places are thinking about it. This is Mill Valley in Marin County, which is one of those places that basically has one road in and one road out or two roads in and out. And so they actually did with Google, they got together with Google and they did a simulation of a evacuation and that from that they developed a evacuation route plans for people in Mill Valley. This is another place in Santa Rosa, Coffee Park, which got totally burned out in the Tubbs fire. And now they at least have an evacuation plan. The problem is most of their evacuation goes into areas where there are other people. So I don't know how much they're gonna be able to evacuate, for example, in this direction or in this direction, but nonetheless, they're trying to deal with this problem. But most people have not thought about this at all. We also are getting, not surprisingly, greater awareness of the mental health of firefighters. I encountered mental health and first responders in the Loma Prieta earthquake. There were people who spent 48 hours, 72 hours on shift, pulling dead bodies out of buildings, and pulling people who were badly injured. And in a couple of cases, they came off shift and then they committed suicide. So, or they broke down totally. So you can't expect these people to go on forever. And you need to think about the mental health of the firefighters that are involved. And a lot of these people are local. And as one of them said, you know, in the old days, we would lose one or two structures. And now we're losing an entire block or an entire town. And these people live in these towns. And so that has a huge impact on people. So we need to be aware of the mental health of firefighters and try to deal with that in a more reasonable way. Some other problems that I think still need to be addressed. If you think about natural disasters, which I do a lot, in some ways, a fire is perhaps the worst natural disaster for an individual because the fire destroys your entire world. Everything that you had goes up in smoke. You have an earthquake, your house could be badly damaged, but you could still get in and salvage some stuff that you happen to leave behind. In a flood, there's stuff that, that isn't flooded. There is some stuff that you could salvage and dry out. A fire leaves you with nothing, okay? Where do you begin when you come back to your house and this is all that's there? So I think this is something that we need to be aware of, and I'm not saying people are not aware of it, but we need to pay more attention to PTSD from things like fires people who are caught in these fires. And I haven't seen much mention of children who are get burned out, whose houses get burned out, and of setting up special programs for those children who's, who've lost everything and have to face the world beginning with nothing. And one other thing to worry about fires, when, when a hill is, is burned over, there's no vegetation left. And it's the vegetation that holds the soil together. It's the vegetation that catches the moisture when it rains. So you wind up with a hill like this. And what happens six months later when it rains? You can get flash floods. So this was the Dixie burn scar. We had a big storm and they put out flash flood warnings for the Dixie burn scar. Because these were areas where there was no vegetation, there was nothing to hold the soil, there was nothing to hold the rain when it came down, it all just came in, gathered together, and you got flash flooding. And this is something we've known for a long time. Geologists often say, yeah, in some cases, the worst damage occurs six months later in the rainy season, when we used to have rainy seasons, rather than from the fire itself. Of course, now we've got big fires, so we get damage from the fires, but there's still the threat of flash floods and of mudslides. This is a mudslide, I believe this is Santa Cruz, Monterey Bay area. 
there was an area that burned. And then well after all of that, there was a, a storm and this mudslide came down into this house. All right, so you're sitting there thinking, I live in the city, it can't happen to me. Yeah, well, that isn't the case, all right? Some of you may have been here in 1991 when we had the Oakland Hills firestorm up on the crest of the Oakland Hills behind Oakland and Berkeley. Lots of houses close together to get that ocean view. Lots of trees. People love vegetation. They wanted it to grow fast, so they planted a lot of eucalyptus trees. Big trees, lots of foliage, lots of eucalyptus oil. And what happened was a fire started. There was a strong north wind blowing down the ridge. And the fire just spread, took out all these houses. This was a wildfire, but it was not a forest fire. It was an urban firestorm. So it can happen. It can happen. This is my house in Davis. And I have a lovely oak tree in front. And my neighbor has a sycamore. And I have other trees in back. And everybody on the block has beautiful trees. But I know that if we have a prolonged drought, if we have a strong north wind blowing and a fire gets started on the north end of town, it literally can blow through all of the town. So I'm aware of the threat, but I don't know who of my neighbors even thinks that's serious. But here's a case last year in the end of December in Colorado where a fire got started and it burned multiple homes in Boulder County. 370 homes were lost. And this was not a forest fire. This was not, a, it was a wildfire, it was not a forest fire. It literally started as a grass fire and then it got blown into an urban area and the urban area went up in smoke. So it can happen, it can happen to you, no matter where you're living. So you need to be prepared. How do you be prepared? Well, they talk about a defensible perimeter. You shouldn't have any low vegetation within 30 feet. You shouldn't have any high vegetation if you can do it within 100 feet. And that should be a defensible perimeter to keep the fire at bay. Don't let debris from other trees and stuff accumulate on your roof because if that stuff is dry and an ember falls on it, poof, your roof is on fire. Don't store gas tanks. If you have propane tanks, don't store them near the house. Again, if a fire comes by, it'll blow up that tank and then blow up your house. Now here's a trick question. If you've been given five minutes to evacuate, what's the first thing that you would grab? Think about it. Do you know? Do you have an answer to that question? Well, here's some things you might want to think about. You might want to have all your important documents. You might want to have them in one place. So you just need to grab the envelope with your passport, your insurance documents, your credit cards, some cash, your driver's license. You might want the bare necessities, which would be your computer, your phone, your tablets, and chargers to go with them. Okay, you lose those, you've lost a lot. You might want some clothes. You might not be able to get back to your house. The house might be gone. So you need some clothes. Maybe not all the clothes in your closet, but at least a little bit of clothes to keep you for a couple of days. Your medications. Do you have them stored in a way that you could easily grab them? Or maybe you've separated some out and you've put them in a separate container. And family mementos, okay? What's valuable to you? What will you really cry about if you lose? And these are things you need to face now rather than have to face them later. You got all that stuff? Then go buy a big knapsack and you call it your go bag. You put it in your go bag and you leave it by your front door or throw it in the trunk of your car and forget about it. When you need to evacuate, you grab your go bag, you hop in your car and you go. Those are things you need to take seriously. New Mexico Department of Homeland Security will give you this checklist, six Ps, people and pets, papers, 
prescriptions, pictures, personal computer, and plastic. That's one way of doing it. You don't want to deal with all of that? Here's a very simple way. Picture yourself in this picture, okay? Your house is burned down in a fire. You've just returned from that fire to the house. And all you've got is rubble. What are the things that you would wish you had taken with you when you evacuated? That's a very good way of figuring out what needs to be in your go bag. And if you have to evacuate, you need to know how to get out of town, how to get out of Dodge. And you might want to have a couple of alternate routes because the best route out of town might already be blocked. And one other thing, and I discovered this when I stayed in an Airbnb in Mendocino, is if you are evacuating, put a tag like this on your front door. Yes, it's an advertisement to thieves that you've evacuated. But more importantly, it tells the police or the sheriff or whoever is checking that there's nobody in this house. There's nobody that that'll save them valuable time. If they see this tag on the door, they'll know that they don't have to go in and look around. That could be five or 10 minutes looking for somebody. If the house got burned, are there any dead bodies in here? If the tag is somewhere visible, then you know that there's nobody in the house. So James Baldwin wrote a book called The Fire Next Time. It came from an old black spiritual that says, God gave Noah the rainbow sign, no more water, the fire next time. And we are facing the fire next time.